Hello, and greetings lovely person. This is RPG Mods Fan, and, in this video, I will be reviewing and discussing the Dungeons & Dragons module before The Lost City, which was written by Tom Moldve and published by TSR in 1982. This module was meant for player characters between the levels of 1 to 3. In other words, it was meant for beginners. This module was written for the Beckme version of D&D. The Dungeon Master should not have too much trouble converting it to 5th edition rules. This module takes place in the Mistara campaign setting, in the environs of the Elysian Desert. In the fantasy world of Greyhawk, the B4 module takes place in the Bright Desert. For the Forgotten Realms campaign setting, D&D 3.5 edition places the Lost City in the Rorin Desert, aka the Dust Desert, aka the Desert of Desolation. Man, too many names for this desert. The module's adventure is as follows. The player characters joined a caravan crossing a desert. Then a fierce sandstorm struck, separating the party from the caravan. The party then heads in the direction to which the caravan was supposed to be going. Within days, any water they had ran out, and any mounts they had have died. The party then stumbles upon a number of stone blocks sticking out of the sand. Soon, the party discovers a sand-covered ruined city. In the center of the ruined city is a five-tiered step pyramid. On top of the highest tier are three 30-foot or 9-meter tall statues. One of a muscular bearded man holding a balance in one hand and a lightning bolt in the other. The middle statue is of a winged child with two snakes twined about its body. The child holds a wand in one hand and a handful of coins in the other. The third statue is of a beautiful woman. In her hands she holds a shaft of wheat and a sword. A search of the ruins revealed no source of food or water. So, the party decided to climb the pyramid. On the top tier, they find the dead body of a hobgoblin holding open a door that leads into the pyramid. This module may seem like a railroad adventure and, at times, requires a suspension of disbelief. But, remember, this module was meant for beginners. By exploring a tiered step pyramid structure from top to bottom, it keeps things simple for both the players and the Dungeon Master. I will now be discussing the module itself, and this video will contain spoilers. Unless you are a Dungeon Master who will be running this module for their players, or are a player who already played through this module and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. Centuries ago, Synodicia was the capital of a kingdom. Its last and greatest king was King Alexander. Upon King Alexander's death, a huge step pyramid was built in his honor. The fall of Synodicia began on the day that workers digging under the Great Pyramid chanced upon the lair of a strange monster called Zargon. Zargon killed most of the workers, and then a large portion of Synodicia's population. In time, a strange cult arose that worshipped the monster as a god. The worshippers of the three ancient gods of Synodicia, Gorm, Usamagaras, and Madaruya, greatly diminished in favor of the worship of the monster Zargon. 
The worshippers of Zargon began to look for strange pleasures and taking bizarre drugs. Chaos soon spread not only inside the capital city, but also outside of it, which allowed for barbarians to sack the city. The only people of Synodicia who survived the chaos were those who had fled underground to the vast catacombs under the city. There, led by the priests of Zargon, the Synodicians tried to rebuild the city. The surviving people based their new life around a huge subterranean lake. On its shores, the people grew mushrooms and other edible fungi. Above, drifting sands covered the original city, and Synodicia was lost in the vastness of the desert. Generation after generation, Synodicians have lived out their lives underground. They effectively became albinos, with pale skin and bone-white hair. They also developed infravision and now avoid daylight. Most Synodicians have now forgotten that an outside world exists. Synodicians have a strange cultural custom of wearing a stylized mask, usually of an animal or a human face. Their clothes and adornments are brightly colored. Via ingesting hallucinogenic mushrooms, most of the time Synodicians are living their lives in weird dreams. This is the most likely state the player characters will encounter Synodicians in, especially the wandering encounters kind. The Synodicians are divided into four factions. The Cult of Zargon is the largest faction. Their priests serve the evil monster Zargon and control the underground city. The few Synodicians who are nearly normal are trying to restore the worship of the old gods, Gorm, Usamagaris, and Madaruya. The warrior maidens of Madaruya. Madaruya is the deity of birth, death, and the changing seasons. The brotherhood of Gorm. Gorm is the deity of war, storms, and justice. The Magi of Usamagaris. Usamagaris is the deity of healing, messengers, and thieves. They look down upon fighters, hence they do not get along with the Brotherhood of Gorm, nor with the Maidens of Madaruya. These three factions are often bickering. Except for the Cult of Zargon, the player characters can join one of the factions. When they do, it will be easier for them to get supplies and rest between adventures. The basic adventure in this module is the exploration of the Step Pyramid. The Lost City module depicts the first five tiers of a Step Pyramid. Hidden beneath the Step Pyramid are five more tiers or levels. However, for these tiers, the module takes a very minimalist approach. For each room, it gives a very brief description, what monster or monsters are in it, and their treasure. Towards the end of this video, I will present the monsters found in the tiers below, along with their locations, as a montage. The entire double pyramid contains over 100 rooms. The module gives very brief notes on the major locations in the underground city. The module also provides eight adventure ideas that use this setting as a backdrop. The adventurer's main villain is Zargon, a giant one-eyed monster and his minions. Zargon layers in the lowest level of the double step pyramid. In D&D 3.5 edition, Zargon has been upgraded from a monster to an elder evil and is now known as Zargon the Returner. 
One legend states that Zargon was the first ruler of the Nine Hells. When Asimodius first rose from his fall, he defeated Zargon and its armies. Zargon was defeated, but its horn could not be destroyed. So, in frustration, Asmodeus cast it into the prime material plane where it struck in what later became the Rorin Desert and was buried deeply. Zargon reformed from the horn years later and struggled for centuries to reach the surface where it terrorized the inhabitants of the city of Synodicea. They eventually came to worship Zargon like a tyrannical god-king, and sacrificed many to appease its hunger. With the adventurous background now out of the way, I will now give a walkthrough of the major areas of the module. The chamber in Tier 1 of the Step Pyramid has three huge bronze cylinders with bronze doors. Unless precautions are taken, each door is trapped. Inside each cylinder is a ladder leading to room number 6 in the tier below. Chamber 6 on the second tier is a storeroom holding spare parts for the machinery of the bronze tubes as well as elsewhere for the step pyramid. Also in this room are three fire beetles. Players, roll for initiative. Room number four was the former quarters of a priest of Gorn. In the room lies the dead body of a hobgoblin who has a full bottle of water in its possessions. Remember, at this point in the adventure, the player characters are out of food and water. Room numbers 11 and 12 are the barracks of the Brotherhood of Gorm faction. In room 11 are five Brotherhood men here. In room 12, there are six men here. Eleven of the men are first-level fighters. Their leader, Grandmaster Canadius, is in room 12. Canadius is a third-level fighter and wears a helm of telepathy. If the player characters act non-threateningly towards the Synodicians, they can then engage in conversation with them. The secret trap door in Canadesius's room leads to room number 24 on tier 3. Room number 7 is the treasury of the Gorm Brotherhood. There is a lot of coin here, specifically 2,000 silver pieces, 500 gold pieces, 2 gems, and a jewelry. Guarding the treasure are 5 giant killer bees. Due to the amount of coin in the adventure, it will be easy for the player characters to become encumbered. Hence, keeping track of inventory and weight carried becomes important. At the center of Tier 3 is a revolving passage. Inside are eight buttons. I would have the buttons be at the corners of an octagon. Pressing a button causes the passage to revolve clockwise until one of its two doors lines up with the proper hall. Tier 3 has the headquarters of three factions. The module calls them headquarters. I would call them chapter houses instead. Anyway. The walls of room number 14A are decorated to resemble the night sky. This room is the headquarters of the Usamagaris faction. Their leader is Chief Mage Origa Serkinos, a third level magic user. The other people in this room are first level mages. Room number 15 serves as their barracks. Room number 16 is Origa's quarters, with a wolf guarding the Magi's treasure. 
Room number 19A is the faction's storeroom. Guarding the crates and barrels are four oil beetles. The crates contain dried food. The barrels contain wine. Warning, rant ahead. The Synodicians do not have contact, nor do they trade with the outside world. The module's environs is a desert. The Synodicians live underground without sunlight. So how can the Synodicians get or cultivate grapes in order to make wine? The module has other shortcomings, which makes me question the IQ of its author. Beyond the two 10-foot or 3-meter tall statues of female warriors wearing masks is a corridor that leads to the shrine of Madaruya. Chamber number 23 is the headquarters of the warrior maidens of Madaruya. Their leader is Pandora, who is a third-level fighter. Her title is Madaruya's champion. Also in the chamber are seven first-level female fighters and two second-level female fighters. Chamber number 22 is the treasure room of the Madaruya faction, and, of course, it is trapped. Room number 24 is the ceremonial chamber of the Gorm Brotherhood. Chamber number 20 is another ceremonial chamber, but it has been wrecked by the cult of Zargon. Entrance to Tier 4 is from the south end of this chamber. The floor will slowly swing down to rest against the ramp in room number 38 in the fourth tier. Tier 4 holds the burial chambers of King Alexander and Queen Zenobia, as well as a few major figures during their reign. Chamber number 25 is a nobleman's burial chamber. There is a sarcophagus in the middle of the room, and guarding it are two white apes. Sorry, need to rant again. How are the apes able to live here? Having magical constructs guarding the sarcophagus would have made more sense. Ugh. Anyway, the mummified body is wearing plate mail and has a plus one sword. This is the first magical weapon the adventure provides. The party will need a lot more if the DM expands the adventure to the lower tiers below tier 5. Anyone opening the door to chamber number 39A will trigger a rolling boulder trap. The boulder will continue rolling down the length of the corridor. For those who are wondering, chamber number 39A does not contain anything of value. As with many rooms in the double step pyramid, the walls of corridor number 26 are painted with scenes. On these walls are painted scenes of King Alexander's and Queen Zenobia's court. The corridor has three hidden pendulum blade traps. The end of the corridor is filled with rubble. The builders of the pyramid on purpose filled the end of the corridor to block the way to the burial chambers of the king and queen. Chamber number 33 is a false tomb. Chamber number 32 is Queen Zenobia's burial chamber. She is now a white and is sealed in a stone coffin. Chamber number 34 is King Alexander's burial chamber. Guarding his body is a banshee. However, unlike Advanced Dungeons and Dragons and the later editions of D&D, the module's version of a banshee does not have a death wail. Instead, its whale deals 1d4 damage to all those within 30 feet or 9 meters from it. There is a trapdoor within a corridor on the west side of Tier 4. 
via a ladder, this trapdoor leads down to room number 44 on tier 5. By the time the player characters reach tier 5, they should, at least, be at third level. If not, then the DM should bump them up to third level. The northern outside entrance to tier 5 is buried under sand. Story time! Two twin brothers named Demetrius and Darius were both sixth level clerics. However, Darius is a cleric and the leader of the Zargon cult. Demetrius wanted to destroy the cult, but Darius assassinated him before he could take action. Chamber number 45 was Demetrius' bedroom. A hooded white robe is draped over a chair in this room. Demetrius's spirit now resides in the robe, and his spirit will not rest until Darius is killed. Any character touching the robe must make a saving throw or be possessed by the spirit of Demetrius. Demetrius's spirit knows where Darius's chamber is, which is in room number 58, as well as the layout of tier 5. Hidden behind a secret door is the Cult of Zargon's treasure room. On the north wall is what appears to be a huge tapestry of a desert scene, but really is a polymorph, which is a new monster that makes its debut in this module. Two stone statues of winged beasts flank the door that leads into the rest of Tier 5. If you have not guessed it, the stone statues of course, are actually gargoyles. Chamber number 51 was formerly the main chapel of Synodicia. On the dais at the southern end of the chamber are toppled bronze statues of the three Synodician deities. In the chamber are two red-haired siblings wearing fox masks and bright-colored clothes. The brother and sister are actually werefoxes. Werefoxes are a new monster that make their debut to D&D in this module. In addition to shape-changing, the werefox has the ability to charm the opposite sex. Being the stereotypical foxes, they are sly and sneaky. They seek to stealthily steal treasure from the party and escape without provoking a fight. Also, there are two running fountains here, so the party can completely fill their water skins, bottles, and canteens. Before being covered by desert sand, chamber number 50 was the main entry into the steppe pyramid. Each pillar in the chamber is carved to depict a former king or queen of Synodicia. A series of mosaic pictures decorate the walls. The 15 mosaic scenes depict the history of Synodicia all the way from its Stone Age to its fall. In the northwest corner of the former chapel is a secret door that leads to a passage to the underground city. Whether or not the player characters find this trapdoor depends on if the Dungeon Master plans on expanding the adventure beyond this tier. Also, all of the factions have their own secret passages to the underground city. Chamber number 52 is filled with bubbling acid that is 6 feet or 1.8 meters deep. On top of a stone slab in the middle of the room is a padlocked box. The box contains 20,000 silver pieces and a clerical scroll. During its early days, TSR must have loved owl bears because they include it in a lot of their earlier modules. Room number 54 is filled with wine bottles, casks, and barrels. Ugh, don't get me started. Anyway, in this room is a drunk owl bear. In chamber number 56A are 10 Synodicians who are in their usual hallucinating mental state. 
Nine Cynodicians in bright costumes and fancy masks are dancing in chamber number 55. Most are dancing as if they had invisible partners. May I cut in? Chamber number 57 looks like a casino. Gambling here are 12 Cynodicians. The secret door on the south wall leads to Darius's quarters. If a skirmish breaks out in the gambling room, then Darius and his six hobgoblin bodyguards will emerge into the room to quell the riot. The dungeon master can conclude the module with the defeat of Darius. Otherwise, the DM can expand the adventure using the five additional tiers below, as well as using the underground city. For an expanded adventure, the module only provides a basic outline and expects the DM to fill in a lot of details. For were rats wearing <laughs> For were rats wearing robes and rat masks are in this hidden guard room, labeled number 48 on the displayed map. The stairs lead down to room number 61 on tier 6. However, if the dungeon master does not plan on expanding the adventure beyond tier 5, then the stairs will end up in a bricked up wall. With the exception of the undead and constructs, Having living monsters layering so close together and with no direct access to the outside world, especially for the flying creatures in the tiers below, makes no sense. Especially when the double step pyramid is located in the middle of a desert. Some notable monsters include a pair of hill giants, a blue dragon, a chimera, a hydra, and a vampire. I have two suggested solutions to this dungeon ecology problem. One, have the ruined city be located in an overgrown forest, or located in an overgrown jungle. Yet, this still may not work because this still makes the double step pyramid a monster condo, and the problem of flying creatures as well as many other creatures not having ready access to the outside world remains. So, more work is needed to make this suggestion viable. 2. The walls of most of the rooms are painted to depict various scenes. Have the monsters painted in those scenes. Then, when a player character views the wall, the appropriate monster will be magically teleported into the room. My preferred solution would be a combination of both suggested solutions. The ancient creature known as Zargon can be found in the lone room of the bottommost tier. The room is slime-covered and littered with bones. Zargon can regenerate its body as long as its horn is not destroyed. Regeneration from the bear horn may take a number of years. Zargon's horn can only be destroyed by casting it into lava. About 1,000 Synodicians live in the underground city. The module only outlines important features of the city. The underground lake provides the city with fresh water and fish. The Island of Death. The island in the middle of the lake is pockmarked with caves. On top of the island is a Stonehenge-like ruin that was built a long time ago, predating the Synodicians. Mushroom fields where edible and hallucinogenic mushrooms and lichens are cultivated. The stock pens are where herds of underground livestock are kept. Oh, I forgot to mention, the module describes the Synodicians as a decaying society because of their overindulgence in drug-induced reveries. Their mushroom fields, livestock, and buildings are all showing signs of neglect. Temple of Zargon The cult of Zargon is the strongest faction in the city. 
Their building has many barred cells where prisoners are kept until the priests feed them to Sargon. The stronghold of Gorm is at this location. The stronghold of Usamagaris is at this location. The stronghold of Madaruya is at this location. Outside of the city and across the lake are the goblin kind cliff dwellings. Tribes of goblins and hobgoblins, as well as a few bugbears, ogres, and trolls, live in the caves off the cliffs. The plateau on top is a wasteland. The mound with a lava pit in the midst of the wasteland glows eerily red and is known as the Eye of Zargon. Hmm. I think the module's author would refer to this as an homage to the Lords of the Ring trilogy. Does that make the player characters Frodo and Sam? The underground city is given some further details in Dragon Magazine issue number 315. A number of new monsters make their debut in this module. However, only two of them are significant. When in human form, the werefox has fox-like red hair and the ability to charm a person of the opposite sex. In fox form, their armor class and movement rate improves, as well as having the ability to charm animals. The polymorph is basically a shape-changer and a non-magical version of the mimic. Roll credits? Displayed are the credits found within the module itself. When I released the first part of my review of the D&D B4 The Lost City module, the video got a comment from Smith Ryan Smith. In the comment, he mentions how the module was inspired by Robert E. Howard's Red Nails Tale. To Smith Ryan Smith, thank you very much for your comment. In order to make my review of the B4 module complete, I should briefly discuss the Red Nails story. In the B4 module, Tom Moldvay lifted many elements from Robert E. Howard's Conan tale, Red Nails. Red Nails was originally published in serialized form in Weird Tales magazine from July to October of 1936. In the tale, Conan encounters a lost city in which the degenerate inhabitants are proactively resigned to their own destruction. Red Nails begins in the jungles far to the south. Valeria is fleeing prosecution after she murdered a would-be rapist. She is followed into the wilderness by Conan, who later on in the story becomes enamored with her. Suddenly, Conan's standoff with Valeria is interrupted by a dragon. Actually, a dinosaur, although described with the characteristics of a Stegosaurus and Allosaurus. Both Conan and Valeria try escaping the beast. Down an eroded hillside, Conan recognizes some poisonous fruits growing nearby. Acting quickly, he coats the tip of a spear in the poison and pierces the dragon's lower jaw with a well-aimed throw. Soon afterwards, Conan lures the enraged and injured beast towards and over a ravine. The couple then journeys into a ruined city within the overgrown jungle. A ziggurat dominates the ruined city, and Conan and Valeria enter it. The couple slowly enter a bizarre twilight world. The once populous city is known as Zacholt. Long ago, two brothers ruled peacefully over the city. However, a feud developed between them, and ever since, the city has been divided into two factions. The inhabitants of the city are now degenerate. To make the already long story short, Conan and Valeria get embroiled in the politics and the eventual erupting conflict between the two factions. Both Valeria and Conan are put into peril quite a few times. 
At one point, Conan battles a creature known as a crawler. Zargon from the B4 module is definitely based on this monster. By the tale's conclusion, Conan and Valeria manage to escape, leaving behind a now mostly dead, lost city. Dungeon Magazine issue number 142 has an adventure set just outside of the environs of the B4 module called Mask of Dreams. In my opinion, it is best used as a prequel to the B4 module and the DM can scrap the desert caravan being struck by a sandstorm beginning to the B4 module. The B4 module received good ratings on both Amazon's and DriveThruRPG's websites, averaging a 4.6 out of 5 stars between the both of them. There were quite a few customer comments. I will partially read two notable ones. This one reads, B4 is a sort of tomb of horrors for original D&D. That is, lots of traps, but without the unbelievable fatality of S1. This is an introductory module after all. My favorite element of B4 is that the wandering monsters are mostly made up of the wandering nutballs that inhabit the lost city, which creates a lot of opportunity for players to actually roleplay, i.e. ally themselves with various bands of city dwellers, etc., and not just hack and slash their way through this dungeon. The other reads, a place that should not exist. It is one of the first and best faction modules. It is overwhelmingly tough if the PCs think they are going to hack their way through. They must choose sides and interact with the bizarre denizens if they are going to have a shot. It reminds me a little of I-1 Dwellers of the Forbidden City, perhaps my favorite module of all time. My biggest criticism of B4, unlike I1, is that it takes considerable suspension of disbelief to buy into this strange locale. And like many early dungeon crawls, there seems to be no reason for some of the monsters to be here waiting for the PCs to kill them and take their stuff. This is also one of those modules where the players might ask, what the heck does this thing eat? A modern GM who is used to story-driven adventures might have some creative work to do before implementing this into a campaign. Still, with this bit of prep work, The Lost City is one of TSR's best modules. Thank you for watching. Hope this video has been informative and entertaining. This module definitely has too many monsters in illogical places, aka a monster condo. The montage of monsters with their locations is going to be quite long during the ending music of this video. Till next time, this is RPG Mods fan saying cheers, have a good day, and goodbye.
Stop wasting time Yeah, I wanna run off and fly 